When you cast another distinct comedian uh, in your movie, like Roberto Benigni in this <laughs> and Andrew Dice Clay in your next movie, how compatible are they with your style of humor? Uh, they don't have to be. I, I cast them because they're perfect for what I've written, and and um, they they don't have to in any way be compatible with me. Uh, I didn't think uh, Roberto Benigni would be compatible with me. I thought that he would be that I would have um, a, a difficult time with him. That he would be irrepressible and I'd never be able to get his attention, and he'd be running around, and he'd be crazy, and I'd have to... But uh, in the end, it turned out that he was uh, quite intellectual, and quite poised, and quiet, and and a pleasure to work with, and really had nothing to do with my kind of comedy. He just did his role, and it was, it was quite easy, actually. And Mr. Clay? Well, I, I haven't directed him yet. Uh, that's next summer. Um, um, it's been a long time since we've seen you in front of the camera. Why at this particular uh, point and for this particular movie did you decide you wanted to be in the film? Only because <coughs> there was a part for me. Uh, when I, you know, when I write a script, if there's a part for me, then I play it. If there's no part, uh, and over, as I've gotten older, the parts have uh, diminished. You know, I, I liked it when I was younger. I could always play the lead in the movie, and I could do all the romantic scenes with the with the women, and it was fun, and I liked to play that. Now I'm older, and I'm reduced to playing, you know, the backstage doorman or or you know the uncle or something, and. I, I don't really love that, so occasionally when a part comes up, I'll play it. Uh, I was wondering, one thing, I remember you once told me that you just, you had a drawer and you pulled off the drawer and you looked at all the different ideas that you had and you thought, I think this is a good one. Is this uh, one of the ideas that you had in your drawer? Uh, uh, yes, I have a lot of notes that I, you know, ideas come to me in the course of the year and I write them down and throw them into a drawer in my house and then I go and look at them and many of them seem very unfunny and foolish to me and I can't imagine what I was thinking when I originally did it but sometimes I'll pull out an idea light uh, there'll be a little note written on a matchbook or on a piece of paper that says for example uh, a man who can only sing in the shower and, and it'll occur to me at the time this could make a funny story and that's what happened with this there were some ideas in this movie that did come out of um, the notes that I had given myself over the year Diamond convincing Fabio to sign for to do this pardon me Fabio who played the part of the singer who in the shower did mm -hmm. you have a hard time convincing him or did he understand it and everything and how to do it <laughs> yeah, did he understand it yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we uh, we searched uh, for a long time to find somebody who actually could sing opera and could speak a little English and um, could act a little bit. And then all of a sudden, we met this guy, and he was great. He had all those qualities. He had lived in New York for a year of his life. He spoke English pretty well. He was a pretty good actor, and he had a lovely singing voice. And um, and. So we were very lucky. Um, Mr. Allen, I wanted to ask you about, you've made some beautiful films uh, both here and, and overseas in, in um, Europe. And I was just wondering, what was kind of the inspiration for Rome? Was it, when, when did you decide that you were, the setting was going to be there? And what is it about Rome that kind of appealed to you for the, for the setting for this film? Well, there are two things. One is I had been talking about making a film in Rome for years with the people in Rome who distribute my films. They always said, come and make a film. Come. And, um, and finally, they said, look, come and do it. We've been talking about it for a long time. We'll put up all the money necessary to make the film. And I jumped at the chance because I wanted to work in Rome. And it was an opportunity to get the money to work 
quickly and from a single source, and so it came together like that. Mr. Allen, uh, is it an inevitability that if you shoot in Rome, uh, you're going to eventually shoot in a location from Eight and a Half or a Fellini movie, or did you deliberately choose locations that sort of uh, referred or were similar? It's probably inevitable because we never, I didn't know Rome very well, and, and the art director uh, went around finding pretty locations and interesting locations, and um, you know, I had no idea if any of them had appeared in other movies. I, I mean, I was sure, obviously, if I was shooting at the Coliseum or something like that, it probably had appeared in 50 movies, and, and, and that would be true of a number of the locations. But I didn't really know where I was shooting, and many of the places I'd, I was seeing for the first time, and many of the streets. And, but it's really the art director who found all the beautiful locations we had. So much of the film is a meditation on fame and accomplishment, and I'm kind of wondering what might have sparked the idea to, to focus the movie around that this time and maybe then open it up to everybody else is how you feel about fame in your own lives at this point. It's a, the, the fact that, that some of the film uh, deals with that theme is... Um, post facto. I didn't think about that when I made the film. I, I thought, Gee, it's a funny idea the guy sings in the shower, and it's a funny idea that some guy wakes up one day and suddenly he's famous and doesn't really know why, and uh, two young people come to Rome and they get, they're just married and they get involved in the situation. I, I had never thought of any thematic connection in any way, and that's that's all just an accident. That may have been something that was on my unconscious uh, at the time, and, and it, it came out in some strange way. I myself feel about fame the way the character, where the chauffeur uh, talks about it in the movie, that, uh, you know, life is tough, and uh, it's tough whether you're famous or whether you're not famous, and in the end, um, it's probably of those two choices better to be famous uh, because uh, you know the the perks are better. You know you 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 get better seats at the at the basketball game and you get better tables and reservations places and and if I if I call a doctor on Saturday morning I can get them. You know and there's a lot of things that indulgences that you don't get. If you're just if you're not famous now, I'm not saying it's fair. It's kind of disgusting in a way. <laughs> but I can't say that I don't enjoy it. And and, um, and there are drawbacks in being famous too. But you can live with those. They're not life threatening. You know, if the paparazzi are outside your restaurant or your house. And, and and actors make such a big thing of it and scurry into cars and great things over there. You know, you think they're, they're going to be crucified or something. It's not a big deal. You can, you can get used to that. It's not so terrible. So the bad stuff is greatly outweighed by the dinner reservations. <laughs> In addition to being an accomplished filmmaker, you're also quite an accomplished musician in your own right, and music always plays an important part in your film. It certainly does in this film. Can you talk about the importance of music in your movies, and, and in this, and particularly in this picture? Well, I'm a big believer in music and movies. Uh, it, it covers a multitude of sins. Now, a great director, a really great director, let's say like Ingmar Bergman, did not believe in music in films. He thought the use of music in films was barbaric. And uh, that was his word. And he, his films are great enough so that he doesn't need any outside help. I need help. And uh, I noticed right from the first movie I ever made in my life, Take the Money and Run, there were scenes in it that were just dying when I looked at them in the cutting room. And the editor, Ralph Rosenblum, said, put a piece of music behind it. And I was so inexperienced, I didn't, I didn't, he said, here, let me just put this record on. And he put a, a record on, and all of a sudden, when I was doing something, and it was so boring originally, it came to life. It, it, it just, the, doing it to music 
just made the whole thing work. And ever since, I've been a big believer in supporting uh, the action on film with the appropriate music. And it's gotten me out of a lot of jams over the years. So music for me is a very big thing in films, and I use it unashamedly, and, and I've used all the classics, all the great composers, both classical and Tin Pan Alley, and um, it's the most pleasurable part of the movie, too. When you have a movie, and you look at it, and it's ice cold with no music, then you start dropping in a little George Gershwin, and a little Mozart, and a little, you know, something else, and things suddenly becomes lively and magical, so it's a great feeling. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your younger self? What would I what? What would you tell your younger self? What would I tell myself? Yes, what would you tell your younger self? Like well, it would be, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would not, I would like to go back in time, but just for lunch. Uh, you know, I would not like to live in the past because there are all those drawbacks, as I mentioned in my other movie. You don't get uh, anesthetic when you go to the dentist. You don't get antibiotics. You don't get, you know, uh, the things that you're used to now, cell phones and televisions and things that are very convenient. It takes all year for the ambulance to come. You know, you don't want that. But it would be fun if you could every now and then just meet a friend for lunch at Maxime's in Paris in 1900 or go back, you know, to 1870, just for a couple of hours, take a walk in the park, and then come right back to Broadway, you know. <laughs> I have great faith in the actors, and when they improvise, you know, it always sounds better than the stuff I write in my bedroom, because I don't know what's going on. I'm alone, isolated in New York. Then we get on the set, and it feels different to the actors. And they, and when they improvise, they make it, you know, they make it sound alive. In in uh, Vicky Cristina Barcelona, Javier uh, were improvising uh, whenever they felt like, and I was speaking Spanish. I don't speak a word of Spanish. And to this day, there are scenes in the picture that I have no idea what they were saying. <laughs> I, I just never knew. And but you could tell they were correct by their body language and by the, the emotions they were going through and, and I really I never had to know. You know, I just assumed they knew what they were doing, a professional and and I was right. The film includes so much sort of slapsticky humor and absurdist kind of sight gags and things like that. And in that regard it feels like a throwback to some of your earliest films. And I'm wondering what inspired you to sort of return to that approach to comedy at this point in your career. Those stories that, that uh, make up To Rome With Love, um, a terrible title, incidentally. And, uh, <laughs> my, my original title was The Bot Decameron, and nobody knew what the Decameron was, not even in Rome. Even the Italians didn't know. So then I, I changed it to Nero Fiddles. And um, and half the countries in the world said, well, we don't know what that means. We don't have the expression, and and we, you know, and, I, and you do go through this on a number of movies. So finally, I settled on a generic title like "To Rome with Love," um, so everybody would get it. Um, I, and the stories in this picture are just required that in the telling of those stories, a certain amount of that broader uh, slapstick kind of humor. Not much of it, but a certain amount of it is required. It's just, you can't tell the story and avoid, you know, you just can't tell the story properly without doing that. So, so I had to do it. And I, and I don't mind. I mean, I, you know, it's fun. I like broad comedy. And if I had an idea tomorrow for a film that was all slapstick and broad comedy, and, and it was an idea that interested me, I would not hesitate to do it. Because, uh, you know, I enjoy watching those kind of films, too. I think you've really mastered the art and study relationships in your films throughout the years, and I was wondering what you would say is the greatest lesson you've learned about love. Now, wait a minute. you got to ask that. So I didn't, I didn't hear you okay. clearly. Say it louder and move your lips. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Um, 
I think that you really mastered the, the art and the study of relationships throughout all your films over the years. And I was wondering what you would say the greatest lesson you've learned about love is. Well, I was saying to someone else before that about the important things in life, you never learn anything. Um, you know, you can learn technological things, you can learn about specific things, but you can't, the real problems that, that uh, people deal with in any subjects, existential subjects or romantic subjects, you never learn anything. So you make a fool of yourself when you're 20, you make a fool of yourself at 40, at 60, at 80. Uh, the, the ancient Greeks were dealing with these problems. They screwed up all the time. People do now. Um, all over the world, relationships between men and women uh, are very, very uh, tricky and very difficult. And, and you don't learn anything. It's, it's not an exact science. So you can't learn anything. And you, you're always going by instinct and your instinct betrays you because you want what you want when you want it and um, you know so it's very tough very tough going and and most relationships don't work out and don't last long when they do work out and when you see one that's really lovely it's a rarity it's great that two people with all their complex exquisite needs have found each other and they all, all the wires go into the right places, and it's, you know, it's great. So I've learned nothing. Uh, <laughs> from years and years of, of failure, I've, I've, I have not got anything to say. No, no wisdom. Uh, in the film, your character uh, equates retirement with death. Is that how you feel as well, or do you see a future where you step away from the camera? You know, retirement is a very subjective thing. Uh, I, I was saying this before, that uh, there are guys I know that retire, and they're very happy. They, you know, they travel all over the world, they go fishing, they play with their grandchildren, they, you know, there's a lot of kind of stuff, and, then, and they, they never miss work at all. And then there are other people, I'm one of that kind, that, that likes to work all the time. I just like it. I can't see myself retiring and, you know, fondling a dog someplace, or, you know, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I like to get up and work and go out and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have too much energy or too much nervous anxiety or something, so I don't see myself retiring. Now, maybe I'll suddenly get a stroke or a heart attack and I'll be forced to retire, and, uh, you know, I, uh, but, it, but if my health holds out, um, you know, I don't expect to, I don't expect to retire, but the money could run out. <laughs> uh, you know, it could be that sooner or later, the guys that back the films get wise and then they say, you know, this is not really worth all the uh, suffering and then, and they stop giving me the money and then, but I still wouldn't retire, I don't think. I think, I think I would still write for the theater or write books or. I try and avoid the cast, you know, because they come up with these questions all the time, and I either don't know the answer or, or they don't want to give them the answer. So, so I avoid speaking to the actors as much as possible. With all the films that you've directed, produced, written, starred in, and all the awards you've received, all the nominations, is there one film that's always haunted you? That's the film that you can never forget? That I've never made? <laughs> no, that you've made. <laughs> one one film that's just the most memorable for you? Uh, <laughs> you know, when you make the film, it's like a chef who works on the meal. When you, after you're working all day in the kitchen and dicing and cutting and putting the sauces on, you don't want to eat it. And that's how I always feel about the films. I work on it for a year. I've written it. I've worked with the actors. I've edited it, put the music in. I just never want to see it again. And when I begin a film, I always think that I'm going to make The Bicycle Thief or Grand Illusion or Citizen Kane. And I'm convinced this is going to be the greatest thing that ever hit celluloid. And then when I see what I've done afterward, 
I just am praying that it's not an embarrassment to me. And so I never, I've never been satisfied or even pleased with a film that I've done. I, I make them, I'm finished, I've never looked at one after. I made my first film in 1968, I've never seen it since. Uh, I just cringe when I see them. I don't like them because there's a big gap between what you conceive in your mind when you're writing and you don't have to meet the test of reality. You're home, you write, and it's funny and it's beautiful and it's romantic and dramatic and, and then you have to show up on a cold morning and the actors are there and you're there and you don't have enough of this and this goes wrong and you make a wrong choice on something and you screwed up here and, and you see what you get the next day and you can't go back. And the, there's such a difference between the idealized film in your mind and what you wind up with that you're never, you're never happy. You're never satisfied. So for me, I've, I've never liked any of them and I'm always thankful that the audience bails me out and some of them they've liked in spite of my disappointment. Do you know Annie Hall? Do you know Annie Hall? Annie Hall, let me tell you, when Annie Hall started out, that film was not supposed to be what I wound up with. I, uh, the film was supposed to be what happens in a guy's mind and you were supposed to see uh, a stream of consciousness in his mind. And I did the film and it was completely incoherent and um, nobody understood anything that went on and the relationship between myself and Diane Keaton was all anyone cared of, uh, cared about and I, that was not what I cared about, that was one small part of another, another big canvas that I had and in the end I had to reduce the film to just me and Diane Keaton and that relationship. So I was quite disappointed in, in the end of that movie, as I was with other films of mine that were very popular. Hannah and his Sisters was a big disappointment because I had to compromise my original intention tremendously uh, to survive with the film. So, you know, you're asking the wrong person. I, I you know, when, when you see us up here and we're all, we, we made the film and we're here in California promoting it and everyone's saying what a thrill this was and how great it was to work with this person and how, what, you know, you think we made Citizen Kane or, or, you know, but it always sounds this way at a promotional thing. In the end, you know, you'll see the film or you've seen the film and you draw your conclusion from it, but you know it, it's always to me uh, less than uh, less than the masterpiece I had certain that I was destined to make. <laughs> so much of uh, movies that I love, uh, which this one does so well, is explore to me anyway fantasy and things that you, in your wildest dreams, would ever expect to happen to you. I know you said with fame it wasn't necessarily something you thought about when writing. Was kind of fantasy and, and these big dreams part of that? And, and what are your thoughts when you look back? Do you, do you see that fantasy element? The, the fantasy of... The fantasy of the stories, these, these, you know, all, all the characters and situations that, you know, um, kind of are larger than life to each of them. The, the, the big question of what if, what if this happened if I met this architect who I admire so much, if I invited him back for coffee. <laughs> yes, you're, you're able to do this in film, and real life is generally much duller uh, and uh, inevitably sadder uh, most of the time. But in film, you know, you control everything that's going on, so you can indulge the most fantastic, romantic, escapist, uh, kind of feelings and fantasies. You can do anything you want. So it's, it, that's why it's very seductive and uh, pleasurable to earn your living making movies because you're not living in the real world. You wake up in the morning and you're, you're, um, you go to work, you're surrounded by women like this and scintillating guys who are handsome and witty and gifted and you make up stories and everybody's got costumes and the music's beautiful and you live your life 
you know, not in the real world, and you create something that's completely fabricated and escapist, and um, you know, and it's 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 great, but it's not real, but it's fun. You know, uh, it, it is fun to do, but it, it, it's the only place you can do it is in in fiction. Throughout your career, uh, for a long time, you were saying, I believe for decades even, that you were that you would never leave New York to make a film, and then suddenly, in the last eight or ten years, you've had this whole uh, vibrant uh, array of uh, places you've gone to, and and I was wondering, um, what do you think that you've uh, gained from? Uh, doing that, and and it also seems that your films have had a more um, uh, upbeat and and you know a fun tone to them in a lot of ways. The last few years, do you feel that Europe has fueled that, or is that unrelated, just coincidental to the to the moods of your films? Yeah, it was strictly financial. I I was going to make uh, the, the first one started was Match Point, which was not a really up. A funny film, uh, you know, and and um, but they gave me the money to make it in London, and so I, uh, you know, I was happy to make it there, and then I found that other countries started calling me. Uh, Barcelona wanted me to make a film, and and then uh, Paris and Rome, and I get calls from countries that ask me to come and make films there. So. It's an interesting experience, uh, and the change of venue cannot do anything but help. You know, I, I made, I don't know what, 30 pictures in New York, 40 pictures in New York or something. I can't, I can't remember how many, 35. And then suddenly you find yourself, you're working in London or, or Barcelona or Rome, and the necessity of accommodating to these exotic new surroundings forces you into areas that you would not have otherwise explored uh, and so you you make films and it gives it a certain freshness and exuberance and, and I've been lucky the films that I've made in foreign countries have been coming out good and, and I'm sure the fact that I'm not making them in New York has been one contributing factor. Uh, I think Match Point would have worked in New York. I had originally written it for New York. But doing it in London, I don't know what it was. gave it a certain freshness. I wasn't, again, shooting in Central Park or on Broadway or Park Avenue. And that alone added a, made a contribution, just as Rome in this picture, the, the scenery and the, the very Roman sensibility makes a contribution to the picture that's beyond anything I can contribute to it. It's, it's just uh, pleasurable for the viewer to watch a story unfold in that atmosphere. So, uh, you know, as, as long as that works for me and they keep putting the money up, uh, I'll do it.